Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance to Sogha Shri Prabhupada. Welcome to to today's morning class. This morning we will be continuing with Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2, Verse 35. And the chapter is entitled, The Lord in the Heart. And we are in the section where Sukadev Goswami is describing the journey of the soul to Maharaj Pariksha. And we are very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and Shri Prabhupada. Thank you, my obeisances, everyone. <laughs> and it's all yours, Marge. Marge, it's a pretty long purport, so I would like to ask if you would like some, someone else to read it or me to read or. No, I'm going to break it down sure. as, it go, as, it, as I go along. That's and fine. I'll, I'll explain why also at the very beginning once I begin. Okay. Thank you, Marge. Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. <clears throat> Bhagavan Sarva Bhuteshu Laksita Sarva Maharihi Drishya Bhudhya Divir Drasta Vaksanar Anum Mapakai. The personnel. Now I'm going to make a statement to all the listeners. This particular verse in purport is very, very philosophical and it's very, very difficult to understand. It is an empirical way of you of understanding that you are different than your body. So Prabhupada is going to explain from the empirical way how you can understand you're not this body. <laughs> Or how you can understand you are something different from the body. <laughs> Translation, the personality of Godhead Lord Sri Krishna is in everyone living being along with the individual soul. And this fact is perceived and hypothesized in our acts of seeing and taking help from the intelligence. That requires some understanding. But here in the translation, you, by the acts of seeing, a hypothesizing a hypothesis is one of the ways by which one can understand knowledge. There are three ways. Anumanta, uh, Prayaksha, and Sabda. Sabda is transcendental knowledge given directly from the Shastras. Anumanta is like hypotheses or by perceiving something based on a relative relationship with something else. And uh, Prayaksha is more like empirical study of observation, observational facts, things that you see, and then you reason based on your observation. So here, listen very closely. I'll try to break it down so it's easier to understand the general argument of the common man is that since the Lord is not visible to our eyes, how can one either surrender unto him or render transcendental loving service unto him? <clears throat> to a common man, here is a practical su suggestion given by Srila Sukadev Goswami as to how one can perceive the Supreme Lord by reason and perception. <clears throat> So we can perceive the Lord's presence by reasoning and by perceiving based on that reasoning. Actually, the Lord is not perceivable by our present material senses that we hear all the time. But when one is convinced of the presence of the Lord by a practical service attitude, there is a revelation by the Lord's mercy and such a pure devotee of the Lord can perceive the Lord's presence always and everywhere. He can perceive that intelligence, here it goes, is the form direction of the Paramatma plenary portion of the personality of Godhead. So here is a principle. What does Paramatma represent to us? He represents intelligence. The intelligence is the closest thing connected that we can use to connect ourselves with the soul. And here, Paramatma is that means by which we receive that 
knowledge or intelligence. The procedure is as follows. One can perceive one's self-identification and feel positively that he exists. We all know that one. He may not feel it very abruptly, but by using a little intelligence, he can feel that he is not the body. Okay? Now he's going to explain. He can feel that the hand, the leg, the head, the hair, and the limbs are all bodily parts and parcels. But as such, the hand, the leg, the head, etc., cannot be identified with the self. Mm -hmm. We are not the hand. We are not. These are part of the body, and each one has a distinct definition and function. But that doesn't mean that you become the hand or the leg or the head or any of the parts of the body. And so here is a distinction between who you are, which is not defined yet, and the different parts of the material body. Therefore, just by using intelligence, we can distinguish and separate his self from other things that he sees, okay? So we see things, and we are the seer, we're the perceiver of what is being see seen, but those things that are being seen are separate from us. So the natural conclusion is that the living being, either man or beast, is the seer, and he sees besides himself all other things. So there's a difference between the seer and the seen. Now, by a little use of intelligence, we can also readily agree that the living being who sees the things beyond himself by ordinary vision has no power to see or to move independently. Hmm. So where do we get our power to see? Where do we get our power to move? This is being presented here. All of our ordinary actions and perceptions depend on various forms of energy supplied to us by nature in various combinations, okay? So energy is moving everything, and that's supplied by nature in various combinations. Our senses of perception and of action, that is to say, our five perceptive senses, hearing, touch, sight, taste, and swell, as well as our five senses of action, namely hands, legs, speech, evacuation organs, and reproductive organs, and also our three subtle senses, namely mind, intelligence, and ego, 13 senses altogether all are all supplied by us by various arrangements of gross and subtle forms of nature, natural energy. So we're not the source of the things we have, such as the perception of hearing, sound, touch. It comes from another source. But we can perceive it by, a, by this use of intelligence. And then it goes on to explain... And it's equally evident that our objects of perception are nothing but the products of the inexhaustible permutations and combinations of the forms taken by nature's energy. So, yeah, so, so there's so many things to perceive within the external environment, and they're in, inexhaustible, and there's combinations that makes up different forms, permutations, and it's unlimited. It's the word inexhaustible. Kind of indicates that we can never come to the end. As this conclusively pr proves that the ordinary living being has no independent power of perception or of motion. And we, as we see, undoubtedly feel our existence being conditioned by natu nature's energy, we conclude that he who sees is spirit. So everything that's being described here is being provided uh, with us. So who are we? And then the conclusion is that we are something different than all of this. And then that conclusion is that we are, we conclude that he who sees his spirit and that the senses as well as the objects of perception are material. Okay. You got that so far? <laughs> the spiritual quality of the seer is manifested in our dissatisfaction 
with the limited state of material conditional existence. <clears throat> yeah. And so although we are perceiving and interacting with so many things, it's limited and still there are innumerable ones. So there's the types of dissatisfaction that the spirit cannot interact with these things, although it is perceiving these. That is the difference between spirit and matter. There are some less intelligent arguments that matter develops the power of seeing and moving as a certain organic development. But such an argument cannot be accepted because there is no experimental evidence that matter has anywhere produced a living being, living entity. So that's what this, the scientists use as the basis of their uh, understanding of existence. That as matter combines with other forms of matter, that combination produces something. And then that continues one principle after another. But it cannot produce life. <laughs> that's the point that is being made here. Because these things are all changeable, and we, the seer, are not. Trust no future, however pleasant. Idle talks regarding future development of matter into spirit are actually foolish because no matter has ever developed the power of seeing or moving in any part of the world. <laughs> and although the scientists have been trying, there has never been any success. Therefore, it is definite that matter and spirit are two different identities. And this conclusion is arrived at by the use of the intelligence. So here we come back to the intelligence, which is the manifestation of the energy of the Lord, who is known as super soul, that directs our intelligence according to our desire. Now we come to the point that the things which are seen by a little use of intelligence, cannot be animate unless we accept someone as the user or the director of the intelligence. Now we're going towards super soul. Intelligence gives one direction like some higher authority. And the living being cannot see or move or eat or do anything without the use of intelligence. When one fails to take advantage of intelligence, he becomes a deranged man. And so a living being is dependent on intelligence or the direction of a superior being. Intelligence is the guiding principle. The mind cannot go in any, what we say, orderly direction, but intelligence takes direction and makes order out of it based on values, principles, and desired outcome. Such intelligence is all pervading. Hmm, that's interesting. Such intelligence. In other words, everyone has intelligence. It's everywhere. Every living being has his intelligence, and this intelligence, being the direction of some higher authority, is just like a father giving directions to his son. The higher authority, who is present and residing within every individual living being, is the super self. So we come back now that by the use of intelligence, we can also perceive the source of intelligence, which is something different than all of the, the, the animate matter that we interact with. It's coming from another source. At this point in, the, in our investigation, we may consider the following question. On the one hand, we realize that all our perceptions and activities are conditioned by the arrangements of material nature. So no one can make the external arrangements. These things are all done by the interaction of nature. And how we perceive them and how we interact with them is all done by material nature. And then it says, yet we are also ordinarily, ordinarily feel and say, I am perceiving or I am doing. Therefore, we can say that our material senses of perception and action are moving because we are identifying the self with the material body and that the superior principle of super soul is guiding and supplying us according to our desire. So Prabhupada is bringing us more and more to the point that there are two souls 
one is getting direction and one is ex one is giving direction and all by the use of intelligence everything is perceivable by taking advantage of the guidance of super cell super cell or god in a heart in the form of intelligence we can either continue to study and to put into practice our conclusion that I am not this body. <clears throat> sometimes, just to give a little explanation, sometimes when we give lectures, this is what I usually do in prisons, I'll, the men will be sitting in front of me, and I'll like try to give them some understanding of you're not this body. So I say, point to your head, everyone does, point to your right leg, they do, point to your chest, they do. Then I go through at least a half a dozen or more different things to point to. Then I say, point to yourself. And then there's a, somewhat of a hesitation or somewhat bewilderment, or someone will just point to the whole body and say, that's me. But the whole body is simply made of different parts, that's all. And all of these combinations of parts do not make an individual. It's simply a combination of different parts. That's all it is. And the conclusion is, well, I am something different in this body. Or we can choose to remain in a false material identification, fancying ourselves to be the possessors and doers. Our freedom consists in orienting our desire either towards the ignorant material conception or the true spiritual conception. So we still have that choice, how we're going to use this knowledge that is given to us by the super soul, either to try to enjoy the material energy, thinking that this is what will make us happy, or to start to realize we are something distinct and then question how do I experience life as a spiritual being? <clears throat> it goes on. We can easily attain to the true spiritual conception by recognizing the super self, Paramatma, to be our friend and guide and by dovetailing our intelligence with the superior intelligence of Paramatma. So we're getting the intelligence from Paramatma and then we connect it back to him and that is called devotion. The super self and the individual self are both spirit. Hmm. Well, God is spirit, we are spirit. And therefore, the super self and the individual self are both qualitatively one and distinct from matter. So what does it mean to be qualitatively one and distinct from matter? Distinct, we know. But what does it mean to be qualitatively one? And this will be explained. But the super self and the individual self cannot be on an equal level because the super self gives direction or supplies intelligence and the individual self follows the direction and thus actions are performed properly. And that is if we accept. The individual is completely dependent on the direction of the super self because in every step, the individual self follows the direction of the super self in the matter of seeing, hearing, thinking, feeling, and willing. So we're not perceiving all of this. We're thinking, I'm hearing, I'm thinking, I'm feeling, I'm willing. Yes, but there is a perception behind that. Where is the source of this? these, these different activities come from? And how do we perceive these things in relationship to the activities we perform. Therefore, we can we have to conclude there is a superior intelligence giving direction. So we're going to wind it up here. So as far as common certain sense is concerned, we come to the conclusion that there are three identities, namely matter, spirit, that's you, and super spirit, the Supreme Lord. Now, if we go to the Bhagavad Gita or to the Vedic intelligence, we can further understand that all three identities, namely matter, individual spirit, and super spirit, are all dependent on the supreme personality of Godhead. Hmm. So now we now we take help from Sabda from the Bhagavad Gita. 
The super self is a partial representation of the plenary portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Krishna manifests himself in this material world, in the hearts of all living beings, as his plenary portion, as the guiding intelligent factor for the living entity to both uh, carry out their activities in this material world and also to awaken their intelligence to come back to him in devotion. Okay, so now Prabhupada goes to the Bhagavad Gita. Now we're getting into Sabda. The Bhagavad Gita affirms that the Supreme Personality of Godhead dominates over all the material world by his partial representation only. So God is not directly involved with the material world, but he connects himself through his plenary portion, the super soul, who dominates all over the material world. The whole material world is guided by super soul, which is a manifestation of the Vishnu form of God. We were talking about that yesterday, how Vishnu lies within the heart, and he is nine inches tall. <laughs> he has four arms. And he's a person. And he is the expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. God is great, and he cannot be simply an order supplier of the individual selves. Therefore, the super soul cannot be a full representation of the Supreme Self, Purushottam. That one seems to be a little difficult to understand. He cannot be simply an order supplier. Therefore, the super self cannot be a full representation of the Supreme Lord self because the Supreme Lord, absolute personality of Godhead is the manifestation of providing everything one needs. Okay, so where are we here? Okay. And by the progress of self-realization, one is able to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the use of intelligence, by the help of authorized scriptures, and, and principally by the grace of the Lord. So intelligence takes you very far. It gets you the, to the point of understanding you're something different in the body. And actually connecting with the Lord in the heart comes from scripture guidance that's given by scripture and by the mercy of the Lord. When the Lord wants to give his mercy, then everything becomes understood. The Bhagavad Gita is the preliminary conception of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and Srimad Bhagavatam is the further explanation of the science of Godhead. So if we stick to our determination and pray for the mercy of the director of intelligence sitting within the same bodily tree within our heart, like a bird sitting with another bird, explained in the Upanishads. Then certainly the purport of the revealed information in the Vedas becomes clear to our vision. And there's no difficulty in realizing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev. By the use of intelligence, by the use of um, <clears throat> Sabda, or the explanation given by the Lord directly, as explained in the Upanishads. And then, certainly the purport of the revealed information of the Vedas becomes clear to our vision, and there's no difficulty in realizing the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudev. The intelligent man, therefore, after many births of such use of intelligence, surrenders himself at the lotus feet of Vasudev, as confirmed by the Bhagavad Gita, confirmed by the Bhagavad Gita, seven nineteen, which says Bahunam Ganamamante Ganamam Papadyante Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sadur Lavaha. After many, many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, such a person is considered to be a great soul. So this particular purport is for the jnanis who want to know God, who can actually perceive God through the principle of using the intelligence, through the discriminating factor, which allows one to see distinct what is matter 
what is spirit and where is all of this knowledge coming from what is the source of this matter what is the source of this spirit okay so this is the uh, somewhat of an explanation this purport should be read and studied over and over again and i think as you continue to read and and think about what you're reading it'll become clearer and clearer how the that intelligence is the guiding factor that brings one ultimately to the principle of self-realization and direct and by accepting the intelligence given by god through the heart which comes to super soul but directly through the the scriptures such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, one can realize God and realize their relationship with him. Okay. Marge, this is an extremely powerful class. I'm going to stop sharing and would request devotees to please um, turn on your cameras wherever you can. This is definitely... Uh, chapter, a verse that we have to read and break it down sentence by sentence and write our questions up again to ask again, but amazing. Yes, Silpesh Prabhu, please go ahead. It's pretty powerful. Go ahead, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shura Prabhupada. So Maharaj, uh, how do we connect to the super soul and learn to listen to its intelligence? Because we're conditioned souls, and we're always listening to the crap from our minds. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two answers to that. There's one is the direct connection, and then there's one that's less direct, but still direct. So let's go to the direct connection first. Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, um, verse number seven. This is the direct connection. But then I'll give you the less direct, which is equally as good. Jitamam praveshantasya paramam samahitam sitnosa sukadukeshu tatamaya pabamanayaho. The one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached, for he has attained tranquility. To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. The one has to conquer the mind. <clears throat> in other words, one has to fix the mind firmly in devotion or fix the mind in such a way that it's directed by higher intelligence. And then the super soul is reached. Uh, it's very difficult to distinguish what is the words of the super soul as the mind is always giving us <clears throat> information coming from different sources. But sometimes we say that the super soul is that very soft, sweet voice in the heart, which is hardly perceivable unless the mind is completely controlled and focused on devotion. So conquer your mind, make it very peaceful. That means it's not disturbed by happiness and distress, by the dualities of the material energy. Such a person sees all of these the same. So when you come to that mindset, and then you can then you can hear super soul. But then I'll give you the other answer, which is more or less we like it better. <laughs> The spiritual master is the external manifestation of the super soul. <clears throat> Whatever the super soul is giving you, that same knowledge is coming externally in the form of the spiritual master, who is called the, the external manifestation of the super soul. So the spiritual master is as good as the super soul because he's giving that same knowledge directly through his words, through his life's example like that. So that's why if we take shelter of the spiritual master, ask questions based 
on uh, those things needed for us to make progress in devotional service, it becomes easy. And as you do that, then gradually you can start to conquer the mind also and come to the stage where those who are advanced in devotional service, they're taking help directly from the super soul at every minute. Krishna is guiding that person completely through the heart by, by giving him knowledge, by giving him intelligence, by reminding him or her what they want to do. Krishna Prabhupada makes that point. When you're connected with the process, Krishna is there telling you, oh, you wanted to do this. So he even helps you fulfill your own desires by reminding you what you have desired like that. But then again, it's easy if we're not so advanced to get the voice of the super soul and the other voices that are situated in our heart mixed up. And therefore, we can mistakenly think that we're getting knowledge from the super soul, but it's it's, it's just the just the echoes of the of the mind. That's all. So we can check what super soul says by checking it with what we hear from the spiritual master. That's why it's important to read the books and to hear regularly from the spiritual master. <laughs> Hope that helps, Upesh Prabhu. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. I, I think that's why often when I'm listening to your classes, uh, just in your words, our, our, our questions are often answered without asking us. I think that's the reciprocation of a super soul then. Exactly. Exactly. Very nice question, Upesh Prabhu. Thank you for asking. Very nice question. Rasivinasani Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna everyone. Please accept my humble wisdom to let us speak. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Maharaj, uh, can you explain the word like Anumanta and Prayasha? What is the difference between them? Um, to get a more, one is empirical observation, and the other one is hypothesis. Hypothesis, you can re reference something by what you know in relationship to what you experience. Oh, you know this, you know that, okay, that uh, this will taste in a certain way because I've ever, I've tasted it before and I've had the experience. And so you can say, uh, even though I haven't tasted it this time, you can say this is what it tastes like because I've had that experience. It's hypothesis, using, kind of bringing about some general information based on experience to designate what is what is actually real. This is limited, but it helps on a basic, on a day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Empiric, uh, prayaksha, which is empirical knowledge, is you start to see a set of facts and figures and then based on your experiences, you put them all together and you make a conclusion based on that. Um, the prayaksha and uh, anamanta is limited and one can also fall into the wrong conceptions based on both of these. They're, they're useful, but limited. Sabda, sabda is the, is the words of the, the Lord, the words of the spiritual master coming from Shastra. That is what we really take uh, knowledge from is subda. But we can use these other two in in ordinary dealings also. You know, empirical knowledge means okay. Let me give you an example. Um, empirical knowledge will be okay. I want to build a house, so what do I need? I need wood, I need tools, I need the ingredients that the house is made up of. And then I also try to understand based on my experience, 
how to put it all together to make it house, make a house. That's all empirical. You know, it's just putting putting things together based on what is the the designated use of a particular thing. And then using it and to come to some conclusion. Okay. For instance, that um, uh, you might go around and say that um, man is mortal. But have you tested everybody to see if that's true? You can't, but if everybody you test and get information from, you'll understand, yes, man is mortal. So you can conclude based on limited uh, experience and information that man is mortal. But then again, you might find there's somebody who is immortal, but you haven't met that. So that possibility uh, exists. But then if you take the knowledge from Sabda, then you understand, yes, all man is mortal because it says that based on higher authority. You don't know who your father is, so you ask your mother and she will tell you. Mm -hmm. um, there's different ways to accumulate or understand knowledge. or how things work. <laughs> but the best way, and more complete way, is subda. <laughs> These others can be used in limited spheres for day-to-day -day usage in our life. <laughs> Thank you, Harris. Thank you so much. You remain confused, right? <laughs> 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 Marsh, like like you said, this needs like a breaking down of each sentence and really um, going back and reading it and making sure that we understand each and every line. Mm -hmm. There's somewhere in our scriptures, I don't know where, there's definitions that are given for anumanta, anumana, anumanta, and also you know, prayaksha. If you know, if anybody knows, maybe Sri Devi is there. She's not there today, huh? Mm. Where? Oh, yes, she is. Do you know Sri Devi, this... isn't it in NOD? That's what I thought. Nectar of Devotion, yeah. Do you know, do you know well, exactly there. where you can read it from? Mm -hmm. It's in the very first, uh, in the very beginning. I think it's in the, either in the introduction, the first chapter. Let me find it, Guru Maharaj. Okay. You want to ask your question at the same time? <laughs> my question, dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada. Yes, as Anusya says, this is a very powerful purport and really needs deep uh, analysis and study. Uh, my question is this, Guru Maharaj. We know many times, we know that we are supposed to do certain things. We have been given the order by the spiritual master and we know that this is what we are supposed to do. But yet our conditioning takes us away from doing those things. It tells, oh, you can postpone it. Oh, you can do it later. Oh, there's time to do it. There's not that focus, determination, or urgency to do it. What brings about this kind of lackadaisical uh, behavior when the opposite should be in place? It requires some intelligence to prioritize the activities that we are meant to perform. For instance, what is the most important activity of the day is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. That's why it's given prominence in our scriptures and by the spiritual teachers. And it's also said that that should be done the first thing in the morning. After we get after we get out and prepare ourselves and get ready, then we should be engaged in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Or worshiping our deity and then chanting 
alongside of that. So we give priority where priority is meant to be given to the most important part of our spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the tendency of the mind is to uh, line up everything as in the equal status and then choose what we prefer to do. <laughs> but they're not equal statuses. So that's our conditioned nature. We minimize the importance or the when something is prioritized, just like it says uh, at the time of death, you're not going to start thinking about how to buy your ne next sari, you know. <laughs> so a situation like that brings about a sense of understanding of the priority of the moment. <laughs> but then the scriptures also say that the material world is a dangerous place and one can be destroyed at any moment. So why not so use your intelligence to prioritize what is important and live life in that way? Don't think, well, I have a lot of time. I can do it later. Sometimes we joke and we say, why wait to the last minute when you can wait to the last second? I had to break it down in my mind <laughs> to get it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Actually, I was going to say, Sri Devi is actually in Sri Sopanishad. Not an act of devotion. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember. I knew it was in some introduction, but even I couldn't remember yeah, exactly. Me too. I, I knew it wasn't the NOI. I said, it's got to be either, either the NOD, but it's actually Sri Upanishad. Yes. So, yes. Mark, what it actually says in the Sri Upanishad and in the introduction, it says there are three kinds of evidences, Pratyaksha, Anuman, and Shabda. Pratyaksha, pratyaksha means direct evidence. Direct evidence is not very good because our senses are not perfect. We are seeing the sun daily and it appears to us just like a small disk, but is actually far, far larger than many planets. Of what value is the scene? Therefore, we have to read books and then we understand about the sun. So direct experience is not perfect. Then there is Anuman, inductive knowledge. It may be like this, hypothesis. For instance, Darwin's theory says it's, it may be like this, it may be like that, but that is not science. That is a suggestion, and it is also not perfect. But if you receive the knowledge from the authoritative sources, that is perfect. If you receive a program guide from the radio station authorities, you accept it. You don't deny it. You don't have to make an experiment because it has received from the authoritative sources. Vedic knowledge is called Shabda Praman. Another name is Shruti. Shruti means that this knowledge has to be received simply by oral reception. The Vedic instruct that in order to understand transcendental knowledge, we have to hear from the authority. Okay. <laughs> so in that, in that verse and purport, we went through all three of those, and then we concluded with Sabda, as the summation by which everything is understood. And Prabhupada in the last paragraph talks about the, in referencing everything based on the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Although he gives the other indications, hypotheses, and prayaksha as a means to get some information in, in the right direction. But it's as it says, it's never complete <laughs> or perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Any questions from devotees? Like Marge said, it's definitely, you know, purple that we have to go back and read again and really digest it. 
break it down and write our questions and ask again and again and again. It's pretty, pretty deep. Marge, in um, piggybacking on um, Silpesh Prabhu's question, Marge, you said there's the direct and the not so direct uh, way. And one of it, as you said, is conquering the mind by fixing it on devotional service to the Lord, making the mind peaceful. And the more serious one is um, taking shot of, of the spiritual master. If one were to take the first uh, approach, Marsh, conquering the mind versus going straight to the spiritual master, wouldn't the conquering of the mind take forever, Marsh, because the mind is such a rascal? We don't know how long it's going to be, take to be peaceful. Like, wouldn't that be the really long process? Yeah, but there's different ways to conquer the mind, such as the yoga system. Yeah, like Hatha Yoga is to con to, to coordinate the mind and body in such a way that one can focus their attention on, on the exercises that they're doing, which gives a certain benefit. <laughs> you know, you see people who have very strong minds and they can fix it on something in a very determined way. Uh, so, and there's others who need to work to that or work up to that. And there's others who will take forever and never be able to do it. The more you engage in sense gratification, the more the mind becomes difficult to control. So as you stop engaging in material sense gratification, the mind becomes easier and easier to control. So there is a there is a principle of doing and a principle of avoiding. And Krishna mentions that to Arjuna in the sixth chapter, also sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He says, by constant practice and by detachment, which he means uh, giving up sense gratification, one can control the mind. So that's answered in the same. Uh, series of verses. Mm -hmm. By Thank constant you, practice. So the word constant practice means you have to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Marge. Yes. Prabhupada talks about, you know, people who have just like, he gave the example of Stalin, the big, powerful uh, you know, demoniac ruler of Russia. And he had such mind power, really mind power, that he had to have an operation, went to on his, somewhere on his, some people say on his stomach, others say on his hand. But the doctors wanted to give him an anesthesia and they, he said, no, I want to watch the operation. So he had that power of mind not to be disturbed by the operation and be able to watch his own body being operated on. That's an example of the power of the mind. There was, there are people who have such powerful memories that they they can remember everything they ever heard. Bhakti Siddhanta was Saraswati was like that. There was recently some girl in India who you could give her any figures and she could compute it in her mind. Just give her the figures and she'll give you the, the, the conclusion of the figures. So just by hearing, she could compute it into them. And so people have powerful minds. Other people's minds are so loose because either because of previous karma in past lives or in present life. And the more you can control the mind and direct the mind towards Krishna, the more the easier devotional service becomes. Because the mind is the center of all, all activities. And the intelligence is the guiding feature which keeps the mind in the right in in the direction you want it to go. So both have to be there. Yeah, her name was Sakuntala. Yeah, I remember that. Hmm. Thank you, Marge. Thank you so much. 
Any there's questions? People, I'm sorry, people, Marge. There's people who have such powerful minds, they can read your mind also. Mm -hmm. They can they can tell you what you're thinking. You know one such person, right? <laughs> yes, Marge. <laughs> It was scary. <laughs> yeah, it happened to me also. <laughs> it wasn't scary. It was revealing to me, but it wasn't. <laughs> but it was there, you know. <laughs> Marge, for me, it was scary, I think, because it was the first year of my de devotional practice. And without, um, without him knowing why I didn't come to the temple for the morning program, because I was up till two in the morning with my work doing inventory, before anyone could tell him, if even Prichard could tell him why he says, yes, because she was up late working. And when he told me, I was, oh, my God, <laughs> it was scary. It was scary, March. <laughs> the first year, at least, I felt like there was another bee watching my every step and thought. <laughs> yeah, but he's benevolent. That's the good part yes. about it. Because he's benevolent, it's good. Keeps you on the right track. Oh, yes, Maharaj. He absolutely did. No matter which part of the country he was, he just knew. No matter which part of the country he was, he would write and he knew something is happening. If he was in Africa, he knew what's happening in the U.S. It was like, wow. Yeah. There's people who are very telepathic. And even though... They can sense that someone close to them has had some experience. Usually it's some unfortunate experience. All of a sudden they know it. And then immediately when they investigate, they find out it is true, actually true. Mind is very powerful. Extremely powerful. But if we're into too much sense gratification, as one Acharya said in our movement, it's like there's loose screws up there, he called it. <laughs> the screws are loose. <laughs> well, you have to practice that. Marja, I was just thinking of, about a, a situation that happened years ago when my first daughter, Man Manoharini, you know, when she was very little, she used to always, um, I think like nine months and on, whenever she would see Bhaktivedanta Swami, she would always, she, she was on pins and needles, always like, you know, afraid. And I used that used to bother me. I said, why is this girl always afraid of my spiritual master? And I think when she was about two years old and he was on that swing, you know, much he had that wooden swing outside of the house. I remember that. Yeah, he was sitting there. And I went up to him and because I think I was bringing his lunch or something like that. And I asked him and I openly asked him, I said, you know, why is she always afraid when he sees you? And he said, she's not afraid of me. She just knew she knows that she was with me in my in her last life. And I and now I'm she's with me and I'm here to hunt her down. <laughs> and I'm a bounty hunter is what he said. And it was, um, yeah, it was amazing that he just knew even the kids. He knew that his kids were with him in his last, you know, in, in, in their last yeah. life. He said that about his uncle? He said that about my first daughter. And he also said about uh, Londini also. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. He said that to me with such surety that there was no doubt that what he was saying was... Uh, it was correct. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He was very yeah, and and then that made that gave me comfort. Okay, she's not afraid. She's just remembering what she did in her last life, and he's here to hunt her down. <laughs> yes. Thank you, March. Uh, Mother Olga, please go ahead. <laughs> she's a great host. <laughs> she keeps things moving. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna dear devotees, please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, um, I, uh, so I'm convinced that we are a spiritual soul, but uh, how uh, can I uh, explain even to myself 
that I am not this brain. So I understand with all body parts, but uh, uh, why I'm not this brain? Mm -hmm. Well, the brain is a machine, just like every other part of the body. But it's a more subtle type of machine. So it takes in data, processes it, and then also gives back data that has been processed. The mind thinks, feels, and wills. But then what is that energy that's giving the mind its ability to think, feel, and will? That's the presence of the soul within the body, which is the energy source of the body. Not only the person, but also the source of, of how the body is working. Um, another example would be uh, an experience that I have read about in one of our devotional magazines where it was indicated that there was one boy who took birth and he had no brain cavity, but he lived three and a half weeks, even without a brain. So in other words, the soul kept the body going for a while, but without, because the brain is need to function, it couldn't, he couldn't continue his life. A computer isn't a good example. It's the best example we can come up with. The computer is something you operate. You're operating it, but the computer has the knowledge in it. So you use your intelligence to get what you want from that computer. And what you see on the screen is just a small part of the, all of the information that's there within the computer. I guess you might call it the hard drive, right? Or the hard drive. So yeah, uh, so a computer has actually been formulated simply by the workings of a brain. But you, unless you have an operator, the computer doesn't work. <laughs> or it can't do what it what is designed to do. So actually it's the soul that is connecting with all of the energy in the body and making the body work accordingly. And when the soul is gone, everything stops. But there's an example, at least I know of one example, where even without a brain, someone was able to live for three and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, so you're not the brain. <laughs> That's very comforting, right, Maharaj, to know that we are not the brain. Sri <laughs> <laughs> Devi and I are laughing like any. It's so comforting. The brain is not the master, although we try to make it the master. <laughs> the mind and the brain are different. The mind is the, the thoughts and impressions and emotions that go in and out of the brain. And that's coming from the soul also, based on our perception of of, of reality in our experience in this world. That's also not us either. Marge, I, I remember in one of your class, you mentioned, uh, you referred to, to the mind as the roadmap. Yeah, you, what's in the mind is already mapped out to go into the, that knowledge gives you a direction according to your desire. So it's not planned out. It's, but, the, but, the, but the mind can jump anywhere. Mind has a tendency to keep moving. It doesn't stop. If you can keep the mind in one place for about 10 seconds, you're really good. It keeps moving. It keeps moving. It keeps moving. Meditation helps to slow down the, the activities of the mind where you can focus more longer on something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's also a process of slowing down the activities of the mind and focusing the, those activities in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. Mars, the mind sometimes, it, it, it sounds like the mind is a whole complete different entity from the self. 
Um, it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. The mind can take in anything and everything and process it and evaluate based on whether it likes it or doesn't like it. Is it useful or not useful? Mars, that's a question down in the chat here from, uh, let me get the name up, uh, Dheeraj Prabhu. He said, Hare Krishna, Gurudev, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Sri Prabhupada. Um, everyone is going to die one day. But when we know that we are going to die soon, anything can happen to us anytime. How to deal with this? Yeah, Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 That's all. Just shout out to Krishna and don't stop. <laughs> I'm serious. That, that's an answer. And that way, when death comes, you'll be you'll be elevated to the spiritual world. Marsh reminds me of Tamal Krishna Maharaj leaving his body. It was unexpected, and he was chanting his rounds. We had, uh, yeah, I think he had his bead bag in his hand when he was in that taxi with his disciples and the cab driver mm -hmm. when he was leaving Mayapur after the meetings, right, Maharaj? Something like that? Yeah, anyone who's serious about devotional service will constantly chant. That means if they're doing something, they'll focus on that. But when they're moving around or just going from place to place, they're chanting. Their mind is actively connected to the holy name. Yeah. They take rest at night. They're, the last thing they do is they they're, they re, they chant the holy names. The first thing they get up in the morning is they chant the holy names. We start with the holy name and we end with the holy name. And yeah, the holy name will take you. Yeah. The holy name is so powerful that if the holy name wants to descend into your life, even if you're not chanting, the experience of the holy name can come into your life even without any effort on your part. Mm. In other words, you're in a particular situation. Say you're driving in the car and all of a sudden there's a bad accident. And even though you may not be thinking of the holy name or even remembering the holy name, the holy name will enter into your mind and somehow or other connect you with the spiritual energy. But that's Krishna's mercy for those who dedicate their lives to chanting. Even if they can't remember or forget to remember. Wow. Such mercy. So much mercy built in the process. <laughs> And we take it for granted, Marge. I take it for granted. It's like we forget the small little things. So much mercy, and we literally take it for granted. Wow. Hare Krishna. <laughs> what do you mean we take it for granted? I wow. take it for granted. What does that mean? <laughs> it's just like we don't, uh, I don't realize how much mercy is built in. We, we just operate like as if I'm in charge, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. And, you know, we can move things the way we want, but it's completely Krishna's mercy. He, he'll he decide whether he moves it or not. Yeah. Like We need this constant reminder. Yeah, all we have to do is surrender. Mm -hmm. surrender, to, surrender to the instructions of the spiritual master. Surrender to the process of chanting. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marge. Bala Krishna Prabhu, it's yours. Go ahead. And then I'll go to Amrita Nam in the chat. Wow, we got 42 people online today. Yeah. Interesting. Marge is a hot topic, Marge. It's a hot yeah. topic. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, thank you, Mataji. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Humble obeisances to you. Humble obeisances to Srila Prabhupada. And uh, my humble obeisances to all Vaishnavas here and everywhere. Maharaj, uh, I have a simple question. Um, so given two devotees who are doing devotional service, can one be more accelerated? And how can I get on that fast track, Maharaj? <laughs> Associate with Yuga Kishore, you'll be all right. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. He's not so, only he's not only on the fast track, he's the conductor of the fast track. Wonderful, Maharaj. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm serious. Yeah, hmm. There's there's the there's the example you need. Yes. He got his association. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are very lucky to have him here, Maharaj. <laughs> you are supremely lucky. He is such a great soul. Mm -hmm. Such a great soul. Yeah. Always moving and energetic, never sitting down. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> always, his mind is always moving. Right. How to serve and you know, coming up with new ways. He's 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 the example of a Vaishnava. That's a very nice question, Balkashnava. <laughs> really. Thank Accelerated you. track. I like that <laughs> question actually. <laughs> I mean, is there something more we can do while we are doing the right things? This is my was really my question. Uh, thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> you can ask. You can ask Yugala, what service? Yeah. What service can I do? Right, right. Um, yes, he'll, he'll give you something. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I already do one service, Maharaj, at the, the temple. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I, I could do a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> Very thank nice you. question, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank Mark, you. that's a question in the chat from Amrita Nam. She's, she's asking, when we shift from our material life to devotional service, example, cooking, cooking needs so much focus on Krishna to make the boga to be acceptable for Krishna. So how can we give that shift? I mean, how do we perform it as the service in which the material flashes do not disturb us? How do we keep them on bay? Hmm, a little complicated, the question. Prabhupada would give a very simple answer. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, do it for Krishna. And when you want to do it for Krishna, you think Krishna is the best of all personalities. So I want to do it in the best of all ways. We may not feel the same way when we're doing things in this world because of the person involved or the situation. But when we're when we're engaged in, say, cooking for Krishna, we should think, I'm going to plan it out. I'm going to make it as nice as I can. I'm going to use maybe some hints that I can get from other cooks. In other words, you gather some intelligence based on the whole idea of cooking. Get the best possible pans. <laughs> You know, everything should be first class. And then when you when you have all that, then you're ready to offer something to Krishna. And then the attention you put into it. Study Srila Prabhupada when he used to cook. You know, those who used to cook with Prabhupada, Prabhupada never spoke when he was cooking. Not one word. If he wanted something, he would indicate it to by being by pointing to it. He when he was done cooking an eight or nine course feast, the kitchen was as clean as it was when he started. <laughs> he would cook and clean at the same time. And there was nothing to clean when he was done. <laughs> Can't oh, find that nowadays, Maharaj. <laughs> you go into somebody's house and then you can't even see the sink. The pots are piled up high. <laughs> it's not for you guys. You guys are not. <laughs> I'm sitting at a house with two of my this very dear, dear, dear disciples. First time I've been to their house. Oh, nice. So, yeah, um, do everything in the best possible way. That shouldn't be relegated to, to an activity. That should be relegated to everything we do. Do everything in the best possible way. That means being attentive. 
Don't be spaced out. <laughs> Our problem is we, we have so many things to do, so we just move from one thing to another, sometimes doing something half because we want to get to the next thing. But that doesn't work in devotional service. They say when Prabhupada was, to me, Prabhupada was, was the best example. Mm -hmm. He would move. He was like watching a swan moving in, you know, floating in the water. If you watch swans, they they effortlessly float on the water. It's like you can't even see any effort by the swan from moving. It's just so graceful. <laughs> Prabhupada was like that. Everything he did, his art, his hands, his everything was done in a very what we say swan-like motion that was so wonderful to see. It was like watching a, a beautiful play. I can't say I'm even close to that, but uh, you can kayak in a Michigan lake or Maharaj, you can get that experience. <laughs> it's literally like you're you're gliding. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've been. I was the other day. I was watching two people kayaking. Yes, and they put a lot, they're putting a lot of energy into it. It's not easy. Oh no, no. So, so that's why I said Michigan Lake. If you do it in the sea or in turbulent places, it's not like that. It should be a placid lake that is flowing downstream, and you you barely touch your oars oh. in the water. You're gliding. It's a wonderful yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Marsh, when, when you were speaking about your proper, how your proper, when he, when he cooks, you know, he won't speak. If he wants something, he will point, you know, like no, no talking, no whatever. And that sets the mood of the right mood to do service in terms of consciousness. And sometimes that, you know, it's a challenge nowadays with some of the, you know, in some situations, Marge. Would it be advisable, Marge, when we're doing service, you know, to play a lecture, to play a kirtan, a bhajan, so that we don't, you know, go chubu chubu chubu, you know, like it really helps us to stop talking and really hear, because I think when that is not there, the mind just wanders. Yeah, I do that. Sometimes I sit down with devotees taking prasadam and I'll just turn on Prabhupada so we all can meditate mm. on what we're eating and listen to Prabhupada. Mm. Okay. That helps because, yeah, then yeah, then the cooking also turns into a gossip opportunity, gossip time, and whatever <laughs> happens. The point is to be focused. That's the point. Yeah. Keep your focus. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Any questions from devotees, please? Oh, go ahead, Ananya. Go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I had a question regarding chanting. So this is what I understand. When we when we chant, when we chant loudly and um, focus our mind completely on that, and we chant without uh, incessantly without stopping uh, does does that mean that we are trying to invoke the indweller in this case i say the soul to reveal upon us is that what happens when we chant when we chant with full focus and with when our mind is focused on our chant so i just wanted to know that i don't think it's consciously done but if you're doing it that way that may be a, uh, the experience you you get you can't invoke I mean, uh, chanting is just bringing Krishna into your life it's not that you can um, do anything to bring him in he'll come in when he wants <laughs> so your efforts in chanting is your your expression of your devotion and everything else happens by way of Krishna whether you get a taste for chanting whether 
the super soul is actually uh, realized through the chant. All of this comes by way of Krishna. So make the effort, that's all. But we shouldn't have any perceived goal in chanting. We should think, I want to offer this offering to Krishna as, a, as an offering of devotion to him. That's chanting. Or I want to get purified from my material, you know, desires. Hope that help, Ananya. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I had one more question. When you say purified, what does it mean? Like, basically, I understand. Yeah. So is it like we are not asking the uh, indweller or the consciousness, whatever, yeah, to to reveal upon us? So is, what, is that what it means when we say purified? Purify Krishna says, Srimbata Svakata Krishna. He's purifying the heart as you hear and chant his glories. He's cleansing the mirror of the mind. He's getting rid of all of those material attachments and coverings that are covering the soul. He's doing that, but you're making the effort. Krishna told Arjuna, you have to fight, but don't think your fighting is the cause of your victory. He said, fight for the sake of fighting. In other words, because I want you to fight, you fight. Krishna is saying, you should chant, but ultimately I give you the results. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Very nice question, Ananya. Thank you for asking. Very nice question. Mm -hmm. Going down the list, just to make sure that I don't miss anybody. If there are any questions, please uh, do raise your hand or jump right in and I'll put it in the chat in the next few minutes, few seconds. And um, if there isn't, Maharaj, would you like to end with a round of chanting? I'll have to ask my host here whether they say yes or no. <laughs> Both of them said with very big smiles, Yes. <laughs> Today, I have to honor my host. So uh, grab your beads. <laughs> okay. Uh, Balram, can you get my? Yeah, it's right there. So we'll do one round. Yes, March. <clears throat> Today, so we have to get back on the road. <laughs> no problem. Yes, March. Okay. Mm -hmm. 